Michael Gove is the longest standing cabinet minister in Britain today, having served under four prime ministers. We recorded this programme on the morning that a fifth prime minister, Liz Truss, resigned at an extraordinary moment in British politics. Michael, who taught you history? How is it done? Um, has history always been a favourite subject of yours? Absolutely. I uh, was educated at a school in Scotland, Robert Gordon's College, and had two history teachers uh, there, um, uh, Mr Stewart and uh, Dr McColgan, as I still think of them, uh, and uh, both inspired a love of history in me. But even before then, uh, as a child at primary school, uh, my first introduction to history was through the Lady Bird books, but also R.J. Unstead, who uh, wrote a short four-volume child's history um, of, uh, of, of the UK, of England, um, um, as uh, the two terms were coterminous in, 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 in many cases. Um, and I was just fascinated by the history of these islands. So I know that uh, it's fashionable these days to look at history through a global lens, but I uh, have the slightly old-fashioned view that the history of the nations that form the United Kingdom is simply the most gripping chronicle of human endeavour that there is. And uh, I was inspired by uh, the heroism of great men and women and drawn into their lives. Because again, uh, I know that it's unfashionable to look at history through the lens of biography these days, but those original Lady Bird books, much mocked, um, still uh, drew me in, whether it was Warwick the Kingmaker or Michael Faraday, understanding through their lives their times uh, and the way in which individuals uh, uh, sought to endeavour to shape and to change their circumstances. That's what drew me in. And um, by the time you got to Oxford, um, how important was history as a, as a sort of discipline in your life then? Very. I actually read English literature. Um, uh, as an undergraduate. It was a toss-up in my mind when I applied to Oxford which of the two subjects to read. The reason I chose English literature is because the college to which I applied at the time, Lady Margaret Hall, uh, uh, was uh, embracing uh, male undergraduates, not literally, um, because it, it had been an all-female college. It wanted to have 50-50 men and women. I knew that more women than men applied for English, whereas more men than women applied for history. So I thought I would maximise my chances statistically of getting in <laughs> if I applied for English literature. And, of course, it's very important to... You can't really appreciate well, English literature without history. Well, well completely. And, and this is the thing, that um, uh, English literature at that time was taught not completely, but broadly, chronologically, looking at different periods. And you cannot understand the context of uh, uh, writers in Georgian or Victorian times without understanding the history. So one of my uh, uh, favourite poets, um, uh, Alexander Pope, uh, wrote during the... Augustan age, beginning of the 18th century. You cannot understand the context in which he was writing without understanding the history of the time. Uh, the Don who taught me, Philip Wheatley, um, uh, was a, as much interested in the history of, of that time as the literature. He was a disciple of Roger Lonsdale, who was a, uh, a Balliol, uh, again, English literature Don and uh, uh, someone steeped in the history. But it was also the case that I had friends studying history and I got to know Dons, who were uh, historians at the time, not least, of course, uh, the late, great Norman Stone. Norman was uh, teaching at Oxford at that time. Some of my friends um, were taught by him. Other people whom I got to know subsequently who uh, were near contemporaries but not exact contemporaries, like Dominic Cummings, Boris Johnson's former special advisor, were also taught by Norman. Um, Norman came to a Burns supper that I organised, a, uh, uh, an event at the Oxford Union to celebrate the Scottish poet. Um, and there he fell into conversation with another undergraduate, a, a historian called Patrick Robertson. Um, from that conversation was formed uh, an organisation called the Bruges Group to uphold the principles that Margaret Thatcher outlined uh, in her great Bruges speech where she explained what was going wrong with European integration and why it was particularly wrong for the United Kingdom. So uh, thanks to uh, some Caledonian revelry, Euroscepticism, um, as we now know, it was born. <laughs> uh, Norman Stone, of course, taught me uh, when by the time he moved to uh, to Cambridge, and uh, he gave me some very impressive and important insights as an historian. It strikes me the most important one of which was that uh, never use the word inevitable in history because nothing is inevitable except for German counterattack. <laughs> Um, you obviously later then um, went into politics, became an MP. I'm very interested in the, the ambiance of the House of Commons, which is so suffused with history and 
and the past, uh, the paintings, the um, statues and so on. What effect does it have on lawmaking um, that essentially it's, it's being done in a museum? Well, I uh, I think that uh, it actually instills a sense of humility uh, in politicians. I know that humility is not the most conspicuous quality displayed by politicians um, at the moment, or indeed in history. Um, but but uh, the fact that as you enter the chamber of the House of Commons, you pass by a statue of Churchill, our greatest prime minister. Uh, is a reminder that the chamber uh, 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 which you're about to speak in is one that was graced by him. It was one where some of the most historic uh, uh, junctions in our history, some of the most important moments uh, in the life of the nation were decided. And therefore, it makes you think twice, or should do, about what it is that you're going to say, the arguments that you're going to make, and also the burden of responsibility, knowing that there have been people who have uh, made speeches that have altered the course of events there. So uh, in mentioning Churchill, one is always conscious of the fact that uh, the uh, the end of Chamberlain's premiership was signalled by a speech from the back benches, by the, the famous invocation of the original Cromwell uh, quote about uh, uh, the Prime Minister having sat there for too long for all the good that he was doing and in the name of God, go. That quote sort of uh, encapsulates the fact that at critical moments there is nowhere as electric as the House of Commons chamber uh, in in capturing the the tides of politics. The other thing that I would say about the, the House of Commons is, uh, <clears throat> as everyone sees, or at Prime Minister's question time, you have conflict, a duel across the dispatch box. It is fashionable these days to argue that uh, debating chambers should be European-style hemicycles and so on to reflect the fact that there is a circle of opinion um, uh, rather than uh, simply two contending sides. I completely disagree. The best way in which you can uh, arrive at an appropriate position is through the clash of ideas, through uh, 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 strong positions and strong arguments being made. Um, and uh, obviously one of the historical figures whom I uh, much admire, though uh, his record is contentious, uh, uh, Henry St. John Viscount Bolingbroke, he was the originator of the idea that there should be a permanent opposition, and that was the best way of keeping the government in check, making sure that there was an alternative government, as well as an organised group to challenge those who were acting in the king. Do you agree with um, Churchill's contention also that it's a very good thing that there aren't enough seats in the House of Commons for all the members of the House of Commons and therefore on really packed occasions you have people standing by the bar of the House, you have people sitting on the, in, the, in, the, um, in the gangways and so on. What, um, I mean, his sense was that for the atmosphere, the ambiance um, to be electric, you, you need to have people all bunched up together in that way. Is that, a, is that something you agree with him? Or do you, do you agree with the more modern view that, um, that everyone should be able to sit at desks and, uh, and do their, um, their work as well as, um, as well as listen to debates? No, I completely agree with Winston Churchill. The whole point about a debating chamber uh, is that people should be uh, hanging on the words of those speaking, paying attention, um, and uh, that there should be a feeling um, uh, 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 of intimacy. Um, uh, you're addressing, when you're speaking in the House of Commons, other MPs and seeking to persuade them, uh, even as you know that your words, if, if they're of importance, will be scrutinised uh, by your constituents and by others. So I think Churchill is right. There's one other thing that I would uh, say uh, related to that, um, which is that... Um, uh, uh, I don't want to seem too much of a crusty reactionary, but um, it is now the case that in the House of Commons you can take in your mobile phone or iPad. Um, I think it's 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 the case that this is a surrender to the trend of our times. Um, but two things have happened. It means that people, if they are in the chamber, are not always, to put it mildly, paying attention to whoever is speaking. And secondly, increasingly, questions and contributions uh, to debate are designed not to influence people in the House of Commons, but to be recorded on social media and transmitted as a TikTok clip. And also people read uh, out their speeches on yes. iPads as well, which is which is disastrous for the immediacy necessary for a successful speech. Well, it? quite. Um, and uh, I, I think uh, uh, Churchill and others have made the point that, in, in essence... Uh, if you're making a speech in the House of Commons, if you're a backbencher, you should have one point, one argument to make a minister, uh, two at most, a prime minister, three at most. And you should do so on the basis of having 
rehearse the speech in your mind or having notes which will prompt you uh, to remember the bits of evidence that you may need to deploy in order to make your case. But speeches read out as scripts are not proper speeches. Uh, and in a debate, it is important to be able to acknowledge and respond to the points that are made by others because it is uh, a conversation. One of the things that is deadening about the US Senate, I fear, is that uh, people read things into the record. There's not a sense there that the conversations that matter are taking place on the floor of the Senate, the conversations that matter take place in the uh, in the lobbies and the, um, uh, uh, and the rooms around it. Whereas in the Commons, at its best, you have not just a clash of ideas, but the uh, the response to what is said so that uh, uh, people can measure and test the, the quality of an argument um, more intimately and precisely. This podcast is about the influence of the past on decision making. And so you... I think you you are one of the one or two people who've um, been in the um, cabinet for longest. You're not in the cabinet at the moment, but um, but historically you've uh, been around a very long time. That cabinet table. How often in your political career have you noticed that an appreciation of the past has been a genuine benefit in decision making? It is manifestly an obvious benefit in decision making. Um, it's not the case, as as we both know that the past can be a perfect guide to the future. But the past is a, a chronicle of uh, the follies and achievements of mankind. It is also the case that on everything from how um, uh, foreign relations can be handled, how uh, states will behave, how uh, uh, different cultures and different interests uh, will uh, respond to initiatives from your own nation, history... Uh, gives you as sure a guide as any to uh, what is likely to happen. Of course, it's a cliche that um, uh, it's always a mistake to fight a war on two fronts or to invade Russia. Uh, it's certainly the case that history tells us that any intervention in Afghanistan is unlikely to prove beneficial for the power uh, that undertakes it, and so on. Those are some of the obvious ones, but there are subtler points as well. Um, uh, uh, all states, all leaders of states, ultimately act in their own interests. The uh, real politique of, uh, of a, uh, a Metternich or a Bismarck may seem like uh, an historic antiquity, but Metternich and Bismarck better uh, explain uh, Putin and Xi than anything else. And that is why uh, when people listen to someone like uh, Henry Kissinger, they're listening to him not just because of his experience in the cockpit as National Security Advisor and Secretary of State, but also because he is a distinguished historian of precisely those individuals and the calculations they make. And are there pitfalls? Are there, um, are there moments when we can be too obsessed with history, where we can take history as our guide and that holds us back, that we're not looking at something... Uh, through a fresh lens because we are um, a sort of obsessing about the past. Yes, and uh, and again, there can sometimes be certain historic moments that people uh, look at and interpret in a particular way. So Britain's um, uh, membership of the European Union, I think, was influenced by a generation who were influenced by the, the, the shadow cast by Suez. They thought that essentially... Uh, Britain's capacity, the United Kingdom's capacity for independent action, uh, uh, certainly in the international sphere, had been so eroded that Britain could only succeed uh, as part of the European Union. Um, and many of those who were the strongest supporters of Britain's membership of the European Union saw it through the lens of power lost, rather than thinking about uh, what constituted a successful polity for the 21st century. And uh, even though those of us who argued for Britain's departure from the European Union were accused of nostalgia, my contention would be that those who were uh, some of the most ardent Europhiles were essentially looking for a replacement for empire, um, where some of the most uh, uh, committed Brexiteers were people who thought that uh, in the 21st century, uh, the era of fast feedback loops and uh, fleetness of foot, uh, you needed to have a political system which was more responsive to the people, and that came through freeing yourself from the unaccountable mechanisms of the EU. And, of course, the Suez crisis itself can be seen as... Um as a pitfall of yes. uh, looking at history, because Anthony Eden essentially saw NASA as another Mussolini mm. um, and um, and thought that therefore he had to act in the way that they hadn't acted back when he resigned as Foreign Secretary in March 1938. Precisely. Um, and 
again, if you look at the situation in Ukraine now, uh, there are a number of historical comparisons that can be brought to bear. Um, I think that we need to recognise that the situation in Ukraine is sui generis um, and uh, that uh, uh, while Putin has many of the hallmarks of, of dictators of the past, uh, uh, he's different from uh, the, you know, the position that Putin is in economically is different from the position that either Hitler um, or uh, 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 the Japanese military leadership were in the Second World War. In both of those cases, Germany and Japan felt uh, uh, resource poor. Uh, Japan launched a war. The Southeast Asia Coast Prosperity Fear was uh, 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 their ambition in order to secure resources. Hitler was very clear that he wanted the uh, the grain, the land and the oil uh, that, uh, uh, that Russia had. On this occasion, Putin is the person who uh, has the uh, the energy supplies that the rest of the world wants, and those energy supplies are also in the hands of countries like Saudi Arabia that look solely to their own uh, national interest. So uh, understanding history can help you understand why the situation is different. You're quite right, uh, though, to guard against a, uh, a superficial comparison with any specific situation now and an example of the past. History, hit, history rarely repeats itself, but it is a stock of wisdom from which we can draw on decision-making. Yes, uh, historians repeat one another. <laughs> <laughs> not. Um, but um, for that, we need to have a, um, a knowledge really across society, don't we? Um, people must be taught history properly yes. in schools. And um, when you were Education Minister, this was one of the uh, foremost things that you were trying to, to do, trying to reform schools in such a way that they concentrated on, uh, on chronology and narrative, the key uh, building blocks to understanding history in any way. It always strikes me. Dates, in fact, should be something that are incredibly helpful for somebody to appreciate what uh, came first and, and what came next. Um, what do you think the situation is at the moment with regard to history teaching in schools? Um, I think that it's uh, significantly better than it has been. Um, I think we have some of the most gifted uh, history teachers currently teaching at the moment, and in indeed in state schools. Now, uh, anecdote is not data, uh, but my son is studying history A-level in a state school at the moment and being taught by people who uh, attended a... or he has been taught by people who've attended a range of universities, all of whom are superb teachers. I've chatted to them. Um, they are uh, engaged by their subject, consider themselves historians first and teachers second. Uh, there are people teaching in state schools at the moment, like Robert Peel, who's just written a fantastic book about the Georgians. Um, uh, it used to be the case that a schoolmaster historian would tend to be someone in a public school, rather like uh, uh, Ian MacLeod and uh, uh, Anthony Eden's biographer, uh, who was... Um, Richard uh, Thorpe. Exactly, D.R. Thorpe. Uh, uh, who had the resources and time of being a public school a teacher to, uh, to do that. Uh, but now uh, you have, I think, a renaissance. And I think one of the reasons for that is that the history curriculum changes that we brought in uh, allowed uh, uh, history be, to be taught in a way which, as you quite rightly point out, stresses the importance of chronology and causation, teaches uh, the, the spine, the narrative of British history, and also allows an understanding of ancient civilization and other civilizations. And uh, that is why I think it is a, a subject that is uh, capturing young people's imagination. It's also the case that we have, as you know better than anyone, a renaissance um, over the last two decades in history writing and indeed broadcasting. So one of the other things that has complemented what's been happening in our schools is uh, that you've had uh, so many brilliant uh, 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 historians writing for a general audience, people of academic distinction who are not writing for academia, um, everyone from yourself to Dan Snow, uh, Simon Seabag Montefiore, uh, people who are uh, not cloistered in universities. They could easily, would have had a generation ago, Regis professorships, but their aim is to make sure that, that history is accessible and original. And you've also got uh, uh, broadcasters and podcasters uh, like Dominic Sandbrook and Tom Holland, whose podcast The Rest is History, is hugely popular. Um, and, uh, you know, my son, sorry to mention him again, uh, will move seamlessly from listening to Grime to listening to a history podcast um, because uh, they bring alive a subject by the concentrations we discussed on biography the principle of great lives, even if they're greatly evil, um, and also on the uh, uh, the analysis of uh, 
the the circumstances in which individuals made decisions. One of the problems sometimes with history is the des the desire for some to pass judgment on posterity in order to make themselves more, seem more virtuous now. What the best historians do is to help you understand why people acted as they did in that moment. Um, and that is the, um, uh, I think, uh, a feature of much contemporary history writing, which is really good. You've um, worked with and uh, served under pretty much all the Prime Ministers of the last, uh, Tory Prime Ministers at least, of the last uh, 20 or 30 years. Mm. Which ones would you say had a good grasp of history, a good uh, intellectual understanding of history? Well, I think the two who stand out are David Cameron and Boris Johnson. I mean, I don't mean to malign um, uh, Theresa May in any way. Um, uh, as it happens, um, and the, so the choice of subject you have at university does not determine things, uh, Theresa was a geographer, and you could see that in the way in which she thought. Some of the things that she was most interested in, uh, data, uh, geographical disparities and inequalities, uh, thinking about um, uh, the, the way in which parts of the country, certain cities were underperforming, very much driven by that, that, that mindset. Uh, David Cameron studied uh, uh, politics and economics at university, but he did have a profound grasp of history and a real interest in it, particularly 19th and 20th century political history. Uh, he w had been taught at uh, Brazenose College, Oxford, by uh, Vernon Bogdanor, a very distinguished constitutional historian. Um, and David would uh, often lightly, but not, 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 not egregiously, bring history to bear. Um, his... A uh, principal lieutenant, almost co-equal in government, George Osborne, studied history, loves uh, uh, history. And I remember um, on one occasion uh, uh, hearing about a dispute that he had with the um, uh, the chiefs, the defence chiefs, chief of the general staff, um, uh, uh, first of all, the Admiralty and so on, um, uh, about defence spending. Uh, and they uh, said, how dare the Treasury tell us uh, uh, what we should be spending our money on? And he pointed out the Treasury had, in fact, been created specifically to tell them what they should be spending <laughs> their money on with rich historical reference. And then, of course, Boris Johnson. And Boris studied classics at university, so he is particularly a uh, 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 knowledgeable about ancient history, both Roman and uh, Greek. Um, and, you know, the, the, there were occasions when he would... Uh, cite examples from Thucydides um, about the way in which power should operate. The um, There's a lovely tradition, isn't there, in, uh, in Whitehall where ministers can have portraits of their historical heroes mm. brought in and uh, tell us a few of... Um, of who's chosen what? What it says about them? Who did you have, for example? Well, I I had um, uh, one of the uh, first spy masters, um, uh, uh, Cecil, who served uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth uh, on the wall. Um, I the also... great Lord Bur Burley. Exactly. Did you? How extraordinary! Um, and I also uh, had uh, Canning, uh, Peel, uh, and Bolingbroke. Um, and uh, uh, I would have had. But unfortunately, I couldn't find anywhere in the government art collection a portrait of the great Marquis of Salisbury. Um, so I, I had to make do with a copy of your biography of him on my desk. <laughs> um, now, that's very interesting. So Canning, Canning the great orator. Um, yes. Peel the great reformer. Yes. I mean, I can see why you're choosing... These are okay. the reasons you're choosing these uh, these people, presumably. Yes, and also, uh, uh, I think the, the, that... Um, Canning's foreign policy, he was Prime Minister for a, a very brief time, as you know, but Canning's foreign policy was to facilitate the spread of liberty without unduly committing Britain's resources. So it was a mixture of uh, idealism, liberal idealism, and prudence, uh, uh, which is very attractive. Um, and in Peel's case, uh, uh, again, I'm conflicted about um, uh, the period uh, when Peel and Disraeli were uh, battling, because I think both of them or politicians of immense virtue. But Peel put the national interest first. Um, and uh, I think one can safely say that if one looks back at the decisions that he made, he set Victorian Britain on a course of prosperity. Even though it kept the Tory party out of majority power for 28 years. Well, that that, that is true. Um, and uh, again, uh, this is one of the reasons why I think anyone looking back at it will be conflicted, because some of the arguments that uh, Disraeli and his allies, Lord George Bentinck and others, made will resonate in any Tory heart. Um, but there was, about Peel, I think, um, uh, something uh, impressive, even though... Of course, uh, he wasn't the most charismatic figure. I think it was the case, um, I remember, 
uh, studying Victorian history at school that his smile um, was compared to the silver plate on a coffin. Um, and uh, again, while not sympathetic in, in many respects, uh, there was something heroic about him. And let's go on to Bolingbroke there, because you have uh, signed a contract to write his biography. We're talking um, about Henry St. John, first Viscount Bolingbroke, uh, 1678 to 1751. He was the leader of the Tories. But he supported the 15. He supported yes. the great uh, Jacobite mm. rebellion of 15. And when that failed, of course, he had to go into exile. He didn't return to England for another eight years. I think it's quite impressive, actually, that he managed to get back at all, uh, oh, considering quite. that he'd oh, done considering that. Considering he was guilty of treachery, yes. <laughs> yes. He was a political philosopher, uh, opposed to Walpole as mm. well, obviously. What what attracted you to 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 actually sit down <laughs> yeah. and write um, a uh, um, and write a biography of a figure who um, I've always thought is tremendously important, but uh, but he lived um, two hundred and fifty years ago. Well, uh, there are several things. Uh, the first thing is that, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, when I was studying um, English literature at university, uh, that period was fascinating. So Bolingbroke was not just a political leader and someone who came within a hair's breadth twice of becoming Prime Minister, um, uh, or, or uh, even though the title wasn't used at the time. Um, he was also an intimate of Swift and Pope and the great wits and minds of, uh, of his time. Subsequently, he became a friend of Voltaire's uh, when he was in exile in France. So he was both a uh, politician of consequence at a time of tumult and um, an intellectual and uh, supporter of uh, uh, creative endeavour. He became, uh, when he entered the House of Commons, a star because uh, the Tory party of the time was a party of uh, 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 the squire rocky, for want of a better word, the country party. It didn't tend to attract the brightest and the best. All of the truly ambitious politicians were on the other side, on the Whig side. So the, the Tory party had solidity but no sparkle. He provided the spark. He was a brilliant orator um, and so rose to the top there. But then uh, Icarus style, he flew too close to the sun. Uh, he was intriguing at the very end of Queen Anne's reign with the Jacobin bites and uh, against others in the Tory party. So he fell, exactly as you say. He then fled to France, joined the old pretender, was in fact his, his sort of principal advisor and foreign secretary. The 1715 rebellion went disastrously wrong. So he then reinvented himself and he reinvented himself uh, as a pamphleteer. And he was one of the great polemical journalists of the of the time. He produced a newspaper, The Craftsman, um, which created the, you know, the, the, the parliamentary opposition to Walpole. Walpole seemed as though at the time the great Whig grandee who became the, the first prime minister that we, we recognise um, um, uh, inhabiting that role fully. Uh, but he became the architect of the opposition uh, towards him. Uh, again, he came uh, uh, close to assuming power, uh, but his hopes were dashed. And then he went on to become a, a writer and philosopher and shaped conservative thinking thereafter. So he has many faults. Um, uh, uh, and he led, when he was in power, a life of uh, uh, remarkable licentiousness as well, <laughs> certainly by contemporary standards. Um, so it's just the... He, he, uh, as a way of understanding that time, uh, uh, his life is intrinsically fascinating. I think you can go one stage further, actually. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how you deal with this in your book, because in his book, um, The Idea of a Patriot King, um, 1739, he, I think, sets down the basis for uh, modern constitutional monarchy. Yes. The way in which the uh, he expects the king, he's writing about Frederick, Prince of Wales, who mm. of course never did become king, but it was picked up very much by Frederick's son, George III, and used, I think he used uh, Bolingbroke's book as a template for his own um, reign, which essentially, I think, did... Um, establish the um, the basis for constitutional limited monarchy that we've got uh, today. So I think um, I think Bolingbroke is a tremendously important uh, uh, person. Fascinating that you're actually going to uh, dedicate some time to um, to writing it, and of course, good luck with it. Um, and um, do you see your own career as uh, as are there more history books in you? Do you suppose? Well, I hope. Good. Uh, <laughs> I hope that I will have the uh, the chance to. Um, I mean, again, it's quite an endeavour to embark on. Um, uh, so it, it may well be 
um, that um, uh, uh, when I complete this, that it, it's met with a chorus of derision uh, by the critics, and it becomes clear that um, this is not my vacation. Um, but I'm uh, looking forward to um, a proper research. A, a friend has helped me uh, by directing me towards... Um, uh, the archival sources. So I'm looking forward where, to that where work. Where are they, is it, Madam Inter? Scattered everywhere. Right. Um, uh, but uh, a lot in the British Library. Um, uh, uh, but in, in lots of the, uh, you know, some in Wiltshire, uh, uh, some in Cambridge. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, uh, gathering them all together. And of course, he has a, a, a corpus of written work, as you mentioned, um, f you know, uh, dating from. Uh, uh, quite relatively early in his political career. One of the things, though, there's a problem is that there was no effect of Hansard at the time. So the political speeches that he gave in the House of Commons that roused so many, we've got accounts and letters of what he said, um, uh, but there's, there are very few contemporaneous uh, verbatim accounts of his speeches. And can you also be sure that he wrote everything in The Craftsman? No, um, because there, there, uh, there were others um, who, who would have been part of his team, as it were. I think uh, that which went out in his name, one can know about, and certainly, you know, the, the various things like, you know, the uh, letters to William Wyndham, which are sort of justifications for his uh, political toing and froing, uh, you can be fairly certain were written in his own name. Well, all I can say is we're looking forward to that book immensely. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Michael Gove, for coming on uh, Secrets of Statecraft podcast. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you. This podcast is a production of the Hoover Institution, where we advance ideas that define a free society and improve the human condition. For more information about our work or to listen to more of our podcast or watch our videos, please visit hoover.org.